Hola, hola, buen día y bienvenidos al tercer episodio de Insights, una serie web donde platicamos con expertos reconocidos a nivel mundial sobre temas de neurociencias, salud y bienestar. Para este episodio tuve, tuve el privilegio de que me acompañara el doctor eh, Stephen Poiches. Generalmente los presento ya durante la entrevista, pero en esta ocasión no lo hicimos, así que déjenme les platico sobre él. El doctor Porges es un científico distinguido de la Universidad de Indiana y además es profesor de psiquiatría en la Universidad de eh, Carolina del Norte. Es además profesor emérito tanto en la Universidad de Illinois en Chicago como en la Universidad de Maryland. Ha sido presidente de la Sociedad de Investigación en Psicofisiología y en la Asociación Federal de eh, Behavioral and Brain Sciences. Y además eh, recibió el premio del Instituto Nacional de Investigación en Salud Mental. Ha publicado más de 300 artículos científicos en diferentes disciplinas, incluyendo anestesiología, ingeniería biomédica, medicina crítica, ergonomía, Fisiología del ejercicio, gerontología, neurología, neurociencias, obstetricia, pediátricas, psiquiatría, psicología, psicometría, medicina del espacio y abuso de sustancias. En 1994 propuso la teoría polivagal, una teoría que relaciona la evolución del sistema nervioso autónomo de los mamíferos con las conductas sociales y que enfatiza la importancia de los estados fisiológicos en la expresión de problemas conductuales y trastornos psiquiátricos. La teoría ha llevado al desarrollo de tratamientos innovadores basados en los mecanismos que pueden mediar los síntomas observados en diferentes eh, trastornos conductuales, psiquiátricos y físicos. Es autor de La teoría polivagal, las bases neurofisiológicas de las emociones, el apego, la comunicación y la autorregulación, también de la guía de bolsillo de la teoría polivagal y las aplicaciones clínicas de la teoría polivagal. Es además creador de una intervención basada en música llamada el protocolo Safe and Sound, que actualmente se utiliza por más de 1.400 terapeutas para mejorar eh, la interacción social espontánea y mejorar procesos de lenguaje y autorregulación. Así que eh, los acompaño a ver la entrevista con el doctor Porges, de verdad que está súper interesante. Y nada más antes de que empiece la entrevista, les quiero platicar sobre eh, un término que va a estar siendo mencionado de manera recurrente en la entrevista y que creo que no eh, nos dimos la, la oportunidad de definirlo. Y este es el nervio vago. El nervio vago es uno de los 12 pares craneales, es decir, eh, nervios que salen directamente de la base del cerebro, del tronco cerebral, y el nervio vago inerva la mayoría de nuestros órganos internos. Eh, es el nervio parasimpático por excelencia. El sistema parasimpático es el que está más relacionado con procesos como de descanso y de digestión. Así que bueno, habiendo dicho esto, los invito a que me acompañen con la entrevista. Well, hello guys, welcome to a, an all new episode of Insights, a space where we talk with several experts about aspects regarding health and well-being. Today I'm very proud and honored to, to have with us uh, Dr. Stephen Porges. Hello, hello Dr. Porges, how are you doing? I'm doing fine and thank you very much for inviting me to uh, be on your podcast. Well, uh, thank you so much for, for accepting. So, uh, Dr. Porges is the author of the polyvagal theory. So, I, I would like uh, for you to talk a little about it, uh, so we can talk what how different lifestyle changes can be beneficial for us in yeah. the, the lens of this theory, right? Yeah. You know, well, first of all, the theory uh, teaches us or informs us that not all our behavior is intentional. That often our behavior is a function of our physiological state and if our physiological state moves into a state of defense like we're ill or we're in an environment that's dangerous 
uh, our, that physiological state becomes a neurophysiological platform for defensive-like behaviors. And when our body is safer and calmer, uh, that neural platform is really a neural platform for co-regulation, social interaction, and in a sense, it enables social behavior to be a physiological uh, behavior. So it's a biophysiological behavior or a biobehavioral system is when we socialize. Uh, we are mammals and mammals uh, evolved from asocial reptiles and to a very to social species, and we're a very social mammalian species. And sociality is not, in a sense, an option. Sociality is part of our biological mandate. It's who we are. And so to regulate our physiology, which has a lot to do with our health, our homeostatic processes, social behavior is a major, major component of that. And the model of that is really the nursing of a baby when the baby is born. Any mammalian baby is not on their own. So we need sociality, safety to be healthy. Yes, and a, a common topic uh, among the, the different guests has been how, health, uh, how we cannot think about health in terms of mental health as separate from emotional health and physical health. So I think what polyvagal theory teaches us is uh, the, the, the biological basis, right? Or... Well, it basically uh, reframes mental health into physical health. It's the same system. So we are basically, we have mental health practitioners and we have physical health practitioners. We have educators who are dealing with the mind, but there's no separation of our mental activities and our physiological activities. They're part of an integrated nervous system. And that's a very important message because we are always confronted with, is it top down or is it bottom up? It's both. And of course we can visualize and come up with very positive narratives and our bodies can relax and calm down. And if we shift the narrative, we get worked up and excited. But likewise, if we have visceral pain, it's sending cues up to our brain that we're in a state of defense and our thoughts become very biased, our behaviors become biased to become defensive. And the issue is we have to categorize defensive behaviors and defensive physiological states as disruptors to normal biological health growth and restoration. This is disruptors of our homeostatic processes. Disruptors that are not necessarily bad in the short term, but can be catastrophic if they're chronic. Yes, so uh, responses, defensive responses that are originally there to, to let us survive uh, in the presence of certain external threats yeah. may actually be, uh, well, setting a, a perfect physiological state for illness when, when being chronic and special in this, yeah. in this era, right? Yeah, well, the disruptors of they're, they can be transitory disruptors, which is really how our nervous system evolves. You deal with challenges, then you relax. You get upset, then someone is in your world to help you calm down. So it's not, the body has an, under, an, an understanding that, yes, we turn off our homeostatic functions to get our body into a safe environment, but then there are safe environments, and then our body flourishes. The problem is not merely with transitory effects of you're hurt or you're injured or even the pandemic, which is a more chronic one, but it also has to do with our culture. Our culture doesn't seem to have enough respect for our needs to be safe in the presence of others because the culture actually starts to interpret quiescence or calmness as laziness. So if you think about university settings, uh, it's chronic threat, whether you're a student or a faculty member. It's chronic threat. So it's all about evaluation. Our nervous systems interpret evaluation unambiguously. It's a threat. And if we really want to see this, we can look at young kids who don't want to go to school. They have all these gastric and gut pain problems because their bodies are interpreting the environment as life threat. Yes. So our bodies are telling us what's going on. Our minds are due to our culture. Say, so forget what your body's telling you, override it, and we do a very good job at overriding it. And in a sense, we're blocking the feedback loops from our body, 
which is telling us that our bodies not are not in safe environments. Yeah, so, so in a sense, these cultural expectations uh, do not allow or don't allow us to engage in this self-regulation because of what others might think. Right. What we're doing is we're, we're creating a culture in which we numb or downregulate the feedback from our body. We ignore it. We may feel it. And then we are told, get over that. Don't feel it. You know, go study, get that paper out, write that paper, get that grant, or do, do your job. And in many cases, we have no choice because our work demands, our financial demands require that we don't service or honor our own body's responses. And I'm not saying that we have to respond all the time to what our body is saying, but we have to acknowledge that we may be suppressing what our body is telling us. And we may need to have, quote, recovery time for our body to come back. So it's like you work hard and then you play hard. And so these are like recovery phases. You think about your work, you, then you think about something else. But it's these cycles of, uh, of activity. But we have to think that we are disrupting our biological systems, and we have to have greater respect for that and greater awareness. In this sense, we need to honor ourselves more. Yes, so uh, I think uh, a first very wise advice for, for our listeners would be to start listening to their body and what their body is telling them. Right. I, it's, I think the first step is listen. Don't necessarily follow what you hear, but listen. Let your body tell you that it's feeling uncomfortable. If we don't listen to our body, we start covering it up with psychological constructs. Like you say, I'm anxious. And you don't know, you think you're anxious because of what's in front of you. <clears throat> but during your whole life, you may have retuned your nervous system to literally crave anxiety situations because it keeps you moving. In a sense, so it becomes your temperamental or your lifestyle as opposed to a transitory disruptor. It gets embedded in you. So part of the fallacy is if you suffer from anxiety, you attribute it to something get rid of that thing that you attribute to, the anxiety becomes to something else because yeah. your body has been retuned. And this is the concept that polyvagal theory kind of gives you. It says you've retuned your neural regulation of your autonomic nervous system to be in a state of defense. And when you're in a state of defense, you can call it many different things. You can say, I have to get out of here. But if you're in a chronic state of anxiety, that is a physiological system. You're, you're living through a physiological system that is sending cues of that you have to get out of there. It's dangerous. So your body is in this chronic state of threat. When it's not a rational state of threat, it's just been retuned to that. And so intervention models have to not necessarily give drugs that are anti-anxiety, but have to understand the neural platforms in which you can shift that physiological state. So breathing, you know, uh, you know, slow exhalation, singing, uh, social behavior, uh, team sports or playing with someone, uh, yoga. These become strategies in which our nervous system can now learn other skill sets to regulate. Yeah, and, and as you say, I think it's very difficult to work towards a, a self-regulating uh, or engage in self-regulating behaviors unless you can first acknowledge what is actually uh, yeah. out so of regulation, right? I, I would kind of modify that because we, we can, again, this is a, a cultural Western world bias. And the bias is self-regulation when the reality is the mammalian nervous system evolved to co-regulate to be in, in a reciprocal relationships with others of listening and talking and playing and caring and supporting, or just being in the presence of others. And I actually think the weakness in our cultural heritage is that we have not uh, learned or been exposed enough to super co-regulators, people that uh, give us the model of how to regulate others, and we have not learned to be good witnesses of others. 
So we're always, in a sense, evaluating others, even if they're coming to us for help. And in reality, they don't really want us to help them or fix this. They want to be heard. They want to have a presence with another person. They want that co-regulation. So we're kind of lost with the understanding of co-regulation and we force it back on the individuals and basically demand that they self-regulate. Yes. And, and often that is uh, guised in rewards or punishments, you know, especially in development of children without an understanding that self-regulation is a derivative of successful co-regulation, meaning that if you have a good experience and a good uh, history of co-regulating, finding safety with others, you're more resilient, which means that you are better self-regulators. Okay, so uh, this concept of co-regulation is actually uh, pivotal for uh, a later development of correct self-regulation strategies. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, if you think in terms of the babies basically being uh, nur nur nurtured all the time, yes. you find out that those that have reliable nurturance can be left alone for longer periods of time. They regulate their life becomes predictable early, early for them. So one of the thing that, things that our nervous system, especially our autonomic nervous system, is capable of learning, it's temporal relationships. So one of the things about self-regulation and co-regulation is how long can you be by yourself? If your nervous system has the expectation that uh, the person will come back in a half hour or 20 minutes, then the loss of that person or the retraction or withdrawal of that person from the interaction is no longer a threat because the expectancy is to be co-regulated, calm down. So yeah, yes, the, the developmental phase is that co-regulation comes in earlier. It has to because the, the young infant cannot manage life on her or his own. I have, yes, and I think that this uh, concept is, is very important, especially in this time when so much people have been forced to be isolated due to the, the pandemic. Yeah, I think uh, there's a consequence. So when we say uh, self-quarantine or forced to be isolated, even if you're in a diet, you know, a small family or a spouse, it's still uh, a difficult period of time because we as a species co-regulate through various people. We don't always demand or require or expect the same person to yes. be available to us. The, the issue is if you're a parent during this period of time, and you're uh, under severe financial pressures, you're concerned about the health of your family, you're, you are really in a, in a sense, a dangerous point in terms of managing families. How do you treat your children? Where's your resilience? Are you a good co-regulator? And the answer is you're probably not a very good co-regulator during this period of time because your body is retuned because there is threat. There is real threat to you, your dreams, your expectations, and your family. So, so this perceived threat impacts also in the co-regulation and that on time and self-regulation. And so yeah. it's like an imbalance between, between uh, all the elements of, of the yeah. family uh, system, uh, right? Right. I would also say it doesn't even have to be perceived threat. Your body is detecting threat. Whether you can label it or not, okay. the, you're, you're still under, you're irritable. So people will say, I'm really irritable during this period of time. The, it, and what, it, what they will be saying is their physiological state has shifted thresholds to respond as if there were threat. So you're in a defensive physiological state. That's irritability. And what we want is resilience, which is you get hit, you get this, you say, ah, it doesn't matter. Yes, and this goes hand hand with hand with uh, coping strategies and, well, the the way people think about threats uh, all together. You know? Yeah, you know, I, I think the part is when we start using top-down or thinking strategies, we mm -hmm. have to first uh, honor and be, acknowledge the, the bodily feelings. 
because if we start merely putting it the top down, we are putting demand on ourselves, we're evaluating ourselves. And it's sometimes we have to say, you know, this is kind of an overwhelming situation. I understand why I'm irritable. I need to, in a sense, go to a quiet room if I can and kind of like do some slow exhalations to breathe more slowly to calm down because we do have portals of, that can change our physiological state. One portal is how we breathe. So we can actually increase that vagal or parasympathetic influence through so, slow exhalations. So it's a portal that we can do. Or singing. Many people like to sing to regulate their, their state. And that's exhaling, exhaling. Yes, and I think uh, very often uh, breathing is underestimated. And uh, I have the, the fortune to to be a biofeedback provider, so with equipment, is is easy to show people how breathing does affect their physiology. But I think some other uh, health providers maybe uh, may have some more difficult times showing oh. the importance of breathing. Yeah, uh, I think you know, as a biofeedback person, you have a toolkit, you have a, a tradition. And the tradition, of course, much of it, if it's autonomic biofeedback, has a lot to do with breathing. And even if you are a neural feedback person, breathing affects that, even though it may not be acknowledged. So yes. you know, we, we calm the body. And, and again, that fits in with meditative practices and other things, calm the body. But translating that into polyvagal terminology, calming the body is inviting a, this ventral vagal system to work, the system that enabled our evolution for, so that we could go from asocial reptiles to become social mammals. It was the system that turned off our defenses. So uh, once we have that physiology working, we turn off our defenses. Without that, we become fragile, meaning that we can react to, to threat. So. Uh you, you were telling us about how this, uh, the vagus nerve has, uh, has led us as, as species and uh, mainly mammals to develop these social skills to calm us down uh, when the social environment is adequate. Mm -hmm. And this is actually a very central uh, neurophysiological concept in the, in the theory, right? You know, the, the theory it could actually be phrased as a phylogenetic or evolutionary journey to sociality mm -hmm. uh, because mammals are social species. The, the problem is in our language and in our sciences, we think of social behavior. We don't think of social behavior as physiology. So what social behavior enabled the mammal to do is to downregulate defense, both behaviorally and physiologically. And what that really meant was it could use social behavior to regulate and optimize homeostatic function, the nervous system talking to itself to optimize health growth and restoration. Once that nervous system shifts to a threat oriented or defensive system, there's a disruption of homeostasis and that leads to disease. Yes, so uh, especially when this is a chronically overactivated, uh, maybe sympathetic uh, yeah. activity. Yeah, but you can even say it could be a chronic withdrawal of the vagal system, which is the system on the sensory part. It's your surveillance system of all your organs going to the brainstem on the sensory part. And the motor part is going back to the organs, helping them regulate in a homeostatic way. So we could say that we could operationally define uh, stress as disruption in homeostasis. We wouldn't even need to use the term sympathetic nervous system. It could already be a dysregulation in how the brainstem is regulating those end organs. But within medicine, there's very little interest or let's say technology or knowledge base to evaluate neural regulation of the end organs of the various visceral organs. There's, yeah. The concern is you measure the organ, the disease is in the organ, but the antecedent to the, to the disease may not be in the organ. It could be in the neural regulation of that organ. 
in a sense, are the organs needs being met? If the organs needs aren't being met, then there could be a disruption of blood supply. There could be damage to tissue of that end organ. And, and by the way, that's why we often use uh, terms like we say, oh, was that caused by stress? Was that cardiovascular disorder? Was that vascular disorder? Pulmonary? Was that stress related? And what you end up hearing is, well, it could be exacerbated by stress or it could be disrupted by stress. And that just becomes this vague concept. It's not in the sense saying, this is the pathway. If we disrupt the neural feedback loops to these organs, we're creating a physiological environment that welcomes disease. It doesn't welcome health. Yes. And, and in pretty much the same way, uh, we can adopt certain strategies and certain uh, habits that will promote or that we can help our, our own physiology promote a, a health environment. Yeah, yeah. Um, and again, that welcoming physiology is also going to be related to a degree of co-regulation with others. Uh, and this is why the pandemic is being linked uh, with lots of other health related issues because people aren't getting sufficient co-regulation with others. Yes. Well, that's, uh, that's definitely, I think, something that uh, people will, will want to look into. Uh, I know that it's, uh, well, it's difficult to abandon the safety procedures and safety protocols, but maybe uh, this uh, search for co-regulation, uh, I don't know if how, how maybe online meetings work in, in terms of this. It's, it's a real interesting question and some of the insight comes from uh, therapists who are doing online therapy and yeah. you get some it's really great, some it's not, you know, and, and you get different feedback from the therapist. Some of the therapists say it's too hard <laughs> and, and others are saying, well, this is wonderful because the clients feel safer. So if they're trauma therapists, they don't, the, the clients seem to like, uh, many of them like it because they're safe in their own home. They don't have to go out. They don't have to shift their own physiology into a more threat related one to get, walk into a therapeutic setting. So it, it's complicated. The, the part is that our nervous systems crave social interaction and Zoom is, you know, it's, it's better than nothing, but it's really not the same. Um, I find my nervous system actually doesn't mind Zooming, uh, but what's happened, I've retuned, my nervous system has retuned during this pandemic. And even though I'm vaccinated, which I am, and I don't really have a fear of getting infected, I'm still not comfortable with people because okay. I really haven't been interacting with people. And, and, I, and, I, yeah, and I don't even know what the cues are that make me feel uncomfortable. It's, it's an undefined because in general, I'm a gregarious person. I like to interact. But I find that if I'm near people, I get exhausted really, which means that my nervous system is under surveillance mode and I, I'm just not comfortable and I don't know why yet. Yes, and, and I think that learning processes uh, play a very important role in this, especially after so uh, such intense months and such bombarding from the news of negative aspects and negative... Yeah. Uh, well, I think what you're saying is part of the, the, the actual root of the problem, and that is so much uncertainty has been associated with the pandemic. And we have to understand what it is that our nervous system craves. It craves predictability. A, a lack of predictability is really threat to us. And now what, what are we hearing on, on the news? The variants. And now we're hearing that maybe the vaccines are not working. First we heard don't worry, the vaccines are working with the variants. Now we're hearing maybe they're not. So what is that doing to our sense of safety? It, it ramps up that threat. And when we're saying, oh, it's been a long year, 
But now if we say this is the way life will be in the near future, it's, it's a hard thing to, you know, we're still saying when we will no longer have to be wearing masks or we can get on an airplane and feel good about that. Uh, and now the issue is that maybe this is going to be the way life will be for a while. And then for me, it's one thing being a kind of a mature and old person, but if I were your age and I'm looking for the future, uh, I'm, I would, it would be very unsettling because I, if I flip back into my own life, I, I had dreams, I was ambitious, I wanted things, I wanted to go places, I uh, wanted to meet people. And those needs aren't really embedded in me anymore. They're not, they're not who I am at this point in my life. But I respect how I was younger, I respect younger people. And I don't know how I would be able to navigate given the constraints that are going on there, they're, they're, uh, it, it's a new world, it's a new challenge, and it's a challenge for many people's nervous systems that do not have great flexibility. Remember, if you have a threat history, meaning adversity history, and your body spends, tends to be in states of defense a lot, this is a difficult time for you. Yes. Uh, and I mean, it's it's also multiple other factors that are happening at the same time, like an in, increasing the use of technology, and this invites for posture to be uh, unbalanced. And uh, I think there are a lot of uh, of things going on that in when when they interact with each other, uh, they maximize this uh, welcoming of the cis in terms of physiology. Yeah. Um, I mean, a, as an academic, for me, life was always about my peer group. Uh, my peer group could be, you know, within the departments I worked or could be around the world. But it was always about connection, friendships, connections. Um, and the whole concept of that academic network is different now. Yes. You know, it, it's even the issue of, like, my son's a scientist. He's an academic. And the issue is, is he in the lab now? Not really. I mean, and what about his laboratory, meaning his staff and his, his team? It creates a whole rearrangement of what we used to do, or what we thought was our lifestyle. Yes, definitely. Uh, Dr. Porges, if we could give uh, the audience some, some tips uh, in terms of uh, polyvagal theory and social interactions, uh, co-regulation and self-regulation, what would be something that they could start doing in order to maybe better? Okay, there's a couple things that are really, uh, people will, will acknowledge relatively rapidly if they start to think about the features of people that they met or they interact with that make them feel good. What is it that makes a person feel good? And you'll start thinking about the smile, the upper parts of the face, You'll think about the intonation of their voice. Uh, basically, what you're seeing is really manifestations of ventral vagal complex working on the face and on the voice. So in a sense, we project our physiological state in our facial expressivity and in the intonation of our voice. But that also has a reflection. So I'm expressing my physiological state with my intonation, my face. But as you hear the intonation, your physiology relax too. So it's this co-regulation in which intonation and facial expressivity are affecting our physiology. There's an evolutionary history here, and that is mammals did not evolve initially with language. Language is what we think it conveys everything, but our body and our nervous system, uh, it doesn't listen to words. It listens, listens to how words are spoken. So it's how people speak, not what they are saying. So the intonation of voice is a powerful physiological cue to us. So the first thing I'm really saying is be aware of what those cues are. And then you start being aware of the cues that you are sending to others. And what you start seeing then is if your body feels open and accessible, arms are out, your voice will sound open and accessible because as I said through evolution, this is how pre 
language or preverbal mammals communicate their physiological state to those of their species so that others knew that they were safe to come close to. That's how they created cooperation and collaboration and relationships. Other mammals through intonation of voice. And that we can do on the internet yet. Yes, and, and I think people can focus on that uh, deliberately in order to start promoting uh, yeah. more uh, regulation and more social interactions uh, among their, their families and even with uh, maybe remote yeah. uh, interactions. Yeah, I think so. But I want to also kind of reinforce the notion about intentionality is because once we become aware of it, we recognize that when we are more spontaneous, it has a totally different effect than if we force it. Okay. So if we force it, the intonation of voice won't work, the facial expressions don't work. So you start thinking of individuals who are on autism spectrum. And you say, smile, well, they'll smile, but it's going to be down below. It's going to be the muscles of the jaw. It's, going to, it's not going to work. Yes. And, but if, we, if it goes up in the upper parts of the face, we see that as exuberance, welcoming, and enjoyment. Voice has the same issues. So when we say, my voice is intonation. Uh, if I relax, my voice has intonation. And if I sing, which I won't do, singing uh, is part of the same process. Slow exhalation gives us that portal. And so sometimes just by thinking for a moment that I'm going to extend the duration of my phrases without taking a breath will calm the voice down. So because as you extend the duration of exhalation, that ventral vagal influence on our autonomic nervous system is increased. Breathing, when we inhale, we take it off. And when we exhale, we put this vagal break back on to calm us. And biofeedback people are very familiar with this and meditative people do meditation and breathing therapies. It's the exhalation that is powerful. Yes. Yeah, uh, there is, there's even some uh, advice from, from, from other uh, experts in the field that even exhalation, you can uh, set maybe a, a breathing pacer in order to make exhalation a little bit longer than inhalation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, you see, if you sing or play a wind instrument, there's no choice. Yes. You're, over, you're going to exhale slowly. And so part of the stories that I love to tell is about when I was younger and I was a clarinetist. And I didn't understand. So people would ask me, where did polyvagal theory came from? So it came from a 15 year old who played the clarinet and that, you know, the uh, regulating the muscles of the face and listening, that's the whole social engagement system of the polyvagal theory is being normally exercised during exhalation. And, you know, as an adolescent, uh, slow breathing, I would say, uh, enabled me to live a good life as opposed to being a reactive life as a teenager. So we start seeing that some of the experiences that we've had when we were young uh, would be, let's say, this polyvagal formed or intuitively polyvagal formed, even though there was no polyvagal theory. Yes. Well, uh, Dr. Porges, I'm, I'm very grateful for, for you taking uh, some time to, to talk to us. I think this uh, these insights that you provided will really be of great interest to, to people and hopefully they will be curious to look more into how co-regulation might, uh, and their social interactions, might promote a, a healthier lifestyle and a more balanced physiology. Right. Well, thank you very much. Well, have a, have a great day. You can stay safe and healthy. Bueno, pues espero que hayan disfrutado mucho la entrevista con el doctor Porges. Yo sin duda aprendí mucho y, y la pasé muy bien platicando con él. Quiero comentarles que ahorita en las redes sociales de Neurosapiens estamos teniendo algunas dinámicas para sortear algunos de los libros de los autores que nos han estado acompañando en cada episodio. Además... Les tengo la noticia de que Insights ahora tendrá dos capítulos por semana. Afortunadamente hemos tenido 
muy buena respuesta eh, por parte de ustedes y además por parte de todos los invitados, así que estoy acumulando un gran número de entrevistas. Por eso no quiero como que después pase tanto tiempo que ya no tengan sentido o que ya, ya los tiempos, este, o sea, como que el tema ya ni al caso. Así que bueno, esta primera temporada de Insights tendremos... El estreno de dos episodios a la semana, todos los lunes y jueves, por este canal, que pueden eh, darle suscribir, denle a la campanita para que les avise cada vez que salga un nuevo video, y comenten, comenten todas sus dudas, sigan las redes sociales y estén atentos de las dinámicas. Nos vemos el jueves. Chao.